Well, Nixon's war on drugs has been demonizing cannabis for over 45 years. We've spent, what, a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars on the war on drugs. Yet marijuana is now legal in some 25 states and growing in Washington, D.C. And more than half of all Americans want to see marijuana legalized. Yet marijuana and hemp continue to be classified as a Scheduled One narcotic by the government, which is the same classification as heroin. This has got to change. Jesse Ventura's latest book is all about this great topic. It's called Jesse Ventura's Marijuana Manifesto. Hey, Jesse, it's great having you back on the Alan Handelman Show. Great to be here with you, Alan, as always. So overdue. This is something we've <laughs> talked about before, but you've decided it's time to write a book about that. What 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 was the, the thing that you said, okay, this is the time? Well, for me, it was personal. Uh... My quality of life was gone, and marijuana has given it back to me. Interesting. And uh, because of that fact, I know other people out there are suffering, and I know it's all because of a government that treats us like children and a government that uh, allows money to dictate what they'll do. Uh, I'll, I'll go into what. It isn't me directly, but uh, someone extremely close to me developed epileptic seizure disorder back in uh, 2012. And for two years, this person went to the doctors and was put on four separate pharmaceutical drugs, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Mm -hmm. It was strictly a hit and miss proposition. Well, try this one. If this doesn't work, then we'll try this after four months. This doesn't work. None of them worked. The seizures continued. They were up to two to three times a week. Now, if you've, if you've ever dealt with seizures as the person dealing with them, it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying because you can't do anything really but comfort the person and hope for the best until the seizure subsides. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I was living under. My life was, as I knew it, was gone. And after the fourth drug, and all of them had horrible side effects, Uh, one was hair fell out, you know, side effects of that order, none of them worked. So in desperation, we took the person to Colorado. I had friends out there. We managed to secure, quote, medical marijuana, three liquid drops under the tongue three times a day, and amazingly, the seizures stopped. And my, I might add, on the way there, a seizure that night in the hotel. Wow. Going there. Yeah, you see it firsthand, and you, you hear about these things, but until you see it, you just don't... Well, don't... And, and then the marijuana, the seizures stop. Yeah. Well, this person today is completely weaned off all pharmaceutical drugs, uh, now can get the marijuana that the person needs in pill form in Minnesota, but I might add... Minnesota so restrictive that what costs thirty dollars a month in Colorado is six hundred here. Six hundred bucks a month, and your insurance won't pay for it. They won't pay for what works. Right, right. And and so anyway, uh, the person's now been seizure free for over two and a half years. And it was two years ago, about two and a half years ago, when I knew the person was seizure-free for over six months. Wow. That I decided I was compelled and had to write this book. Wow. You're the person to do. You know, it reminds me of the actor James Garner. In his uh, book, he wrote about how he thanks God he had marijuana throughout his career because it kept him... Uh, to deal with the pain and all the injuries he had on the set of doing the television shows. And it was marijuana that he, he used throughout his career. Well, you know, when like when Hillary Clinton was running, they asked her the question about marijuana, and she took the typical chicken politician answer, we need to study it more. Yeah. No, we don't. We already finance a university in Israel. They call it the Cannabis University. There's a doctor there, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head at the moment. He's already unequivocally come out and stated marijuana will help post-traumatic stress from our soldiers coming home from these immoral wars. 
he uh, he's also stated it would help the head trauma for the NFL guys that they're all facing now playing football. And let's remember, football's expanding to a world game. Canada has their league. They're playing it in Mexico. So, you know, there's going to be head trauma from this game. I played it. I remember getting head trauma in high school. Mm -hmm. In a high school game, I got... Back then, it was called getting your bell rung. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, that aside, that's a different... But marijuana can help that. Now, imagine that. Players in the NFL are suspended if they use it, but it could actually help them if they got it. You know, Jesse, this is what blows my mind. With all this evidence, over the course of years of research... You still have this image, oh, yeah, well, that's what they say. They just want to get high. You can't get, why is it so difficult to get across? Well, first of all, Alan, let me add something. My, my friend is Tommy Chong, and oh. you know, we all know him from Cheech and Chong. Oh, he's in fact, a, I dedicated the book to him. Absolutely, and you know, he's a friend of mine. He's, he's a frequent guest on the show. He's brilliant. Yes, I, you know, going to jail the way he, you know, what they sent him to jail for and all the things that he's went through. A great well, man. He's a brilliant man, too. He's not the character all the time that you see in the Cheech and Chong film. Right. You know, he's exceptionally intelligent. And uh, Tommy explained to me, he said there should be no difference between, quote, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana because he said the whole plant is medical. And he said, those that smoke it for the euphoric feeling are doing it for their mental health. Mm -hmm. And I would rather see someone take a hit of pot than to be put on Prozac. Absolutely. You know, and and here's here's, here's why, Alan. I'll give it to you. It always comes back to money. Always. Here's the rub. Marijuana, poor people could get it for free. I remember growing up in South Minneapolis, city center by Lake Street Bridge, right in the heart of Minneapolis. We had a little tiny backyard, but my mom would carve up about a third of it and grow tomatoes. Well, you could do the same thing with marijuana. You could grow five to six marijuana plants in a small backyard. You would have it, and you wouldn't have to pay anybody a cent for it. We just eat tomatoes for free all summer. And that's the rub. That is. The government, the gov- I've been in it. The government would charge you for the air you breathe if they could. The point is, you could, poor people could get marijuana. They could grow it themselves. They wouldn't be beholding the big pharma and the corporations. And they wouldn't have to pay the government. And that's the real rub. The government doesn't want you to be able to do anything without them getting paid. Tell me something that you can do other than breathing (laughs) that you don't have to pay the government in some form to do it. Yeah, it's got to be a middleman somewhere. When I was governor one time, Alan, you'd find this funny. I told my staff before dinner, lunch one day, I said, think about this at lunch, and we're going to talk when we come back. We're having a staff meeting. I said, tell me one thing in your life that government doesn't control. They couldn't. One of them said sleeping, and I thought for a moment, and I said, ooh, they may have me there, but then I thought, no, you got that tag on your mattress that says if you rip it off, you'll go to jail. (laughs) Or I was going to say thoughts. You got your thoughts, I suppose. Oh, no, you can go to jail. Look, (laughs) Alan, I got one. Maybe you can help me with this one. Okay. Because I've been meaning to write a letter. I got to talk to some In Minnesota... We just prosecuted a group of young Somali men about 20 years old and sent them to prison for 35 years because they were attempting to join ISIS. Oh, my God. Now, wait a minute. They never succeeded. All they did was attempt to do it, allegedly, and they lied to the government. They got sentenced to 30 years in prison. Now, you've heard of the Jacob Wetterling case, right? The child thing that we just solved? Oh, yes. This guy is only going to do 20. And it's now come out he molested multiple children like they all do, attempted to kidnap another kid, but the statute of limitations has run out on this. He's not even going to jail for the Wetterling murder. He's going for child pornography. They cut a plea deal. Now, the next case in Minnesota... 
the alleged police officer, and he's innocent till proven guilty, who shot the black man in the car seven times at point-blank range, right? Yep. That happened. Whether guilty or innocent, it happened. The most he's going to face is 10 years. Oh, man. Now, how do these Somali kids, who never did anything, actually, they're going to jail for what they had in their heads for 30 years? Yeah, just the thoughts and the attempts. The thought that they were going to join ISIS, they put them in jail for 30 years, and these kids were humble. In front of the courts, they apologized. They did everything they could, and they're going to prison upwards to 30 years. Yet the Wetterling murderer is only going to go for 20 for child porn, and this guy that point-blank shot someone, if now he may be innocent, let's, we'll let the trial determine it. It's going to trial. He's only getting second-degree manslaughter for seven rounds from three feet away. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. I, 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 am I screwed up, Alan? No. Or I mean, am I seeing something wrong here? It, it's, it's, it, there's so much hysteria then around this. Then let me throw this. something in. After what the courts did to me on my case, overturning a Minnesota jury, overturning the trial judge over something that was never even objected to in the trial. Yeah. Yeah. And now I have to go back to court and prove again this, that Chris Kyle lied. Yeah, go, refresh everybody's memory on that briefly. If they didn't. Well, Chris Kyle, the American sniper, wrote his big best-selling book, and I'm the one that sent it to number one. He wrote a chapter that he allegedly beat me up in a, sand, in a Coronado bar because I said horrible things about my old unit, the Navy SEALs. Well, I just happened to own like 100 t- Navy SEAL T-shirts, I was out there for a SEAL graduation. If I was doing all that, why would I hate them? Right. So he writes in his book that he was forced to punch me out, knock me out. And the book, the book had a pre-sale of 2000 when he did that on Fox News, which also owns HarperCollins, the book publishing. They're all together on it. Mm-hmm. The book jumped 100,000 in a day. Wow. And it went it ended up selling forty million. We all know the movie, the whole thing, over an event that never occurred. Kyle lied. I proved it in court. The jury found for me the federal judge wrote twenty four pages who presided in the case, finishing with substantial evidence supporting the jury's verdict and decision. Right. And two court of appeals judges, Riley and Shepard in the Eighth Circuit overturned that two to one over something that was never objected to in the trial. And what was what he, they did it on was the truth. I got bad mouth because after Kyle died, they accused me of going after the widow and the children. Oh, yes. Well, the point yeah. was it was all being paid for by insurance. Uh, and that came out limited in the trial, and that's what they overturned it on. Oh, that's disgusting. Which means the truth the, the court case got overturned because the truth came out. Unbelievable. And Unbelievable and is Fo- right. And, and Fox I, I probably didn't even... In, but that isn't what this calls about, what this interview's about. Right, right, right. But it, it just got, well, uh, yeah. It just shows you, yeah. though, the corruption that we're dealing with. Now, my lawyer warned me, he said, don't call those judges corrupt. I said, well, excuse me. I play golf, and if someone cheats at golf, that means they're a corrupt golfer. Yes. Because you you expect people to be honest at the game. You can cheat. There's no doubt about it. But you're not expected to. Well, when judges disregard their own rules that have stood for 76 years, that to me is a corrupt judge. You sure make a strong case for that. You know, Jesse... As we, we're talking to Jesse Ventura, who is a regular on this show, he's one of my heroes, uh, the author of what, uh, about nine best selling books. Oh, it's that many now, ain't it? I Unbe- gotta quit. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, New York Times best selling books, and the former governor of Minnesota, former U.S. Uh, Navy SEAL, professional wrestler, wrestler. But in this new book, which you did with Jan Hobbs. It's Jesse Ventura's Marijuana Manifesto. Mine's on the way. It didn't quite get here yet. It's the truth about this abundant natural resource and why it should be legalized. Now, Alan, let me state this, 
And this is a fun way to look at it. Right. We, we've been lied to with our history. That's what the astounding thing was when we did the research on this, Jen and I. Uh, we've been lied. Marijuana was the economic engine that drove this country's economy for 150 years. They don't tell you that in history books. The only reason it was dethroned was when they invented the cotton gin. Mm -hmm. And they could mechanically do it then. <clears throat> Here's the fun one. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and Betsy Ross's original flag are all made out of marijuana. Second thing, if Jefferson and Washington, our first and third presidents, were alive today, they'd be busted by the DEA. They'd be doing 10 to 12 years in the federal right. prison as major drug dealers. Absolutely true. Now, does anyone else except Jesse Ventura and hopefully you, Alan, see something wrong with that? Oh, my picture? God, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been on this. Uh, this has been one of my pet peeve subjects on my show for 30-plus years. It's a subject I've always come back to, just as you have in, in all of your interviews and all of your concerns. I just wanted to ask you, now that I know you didn't vote for Trump, yep. but now that he's president... Are, are things going to get worse in this direction, you think? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, you know, the whole thing with Donald is he's been all over the place. Yes. Nobody know He's been everywhere. So having been everywhere, you don't know, you know, what mud is going to stick to the wall. Yeah, in just one conversation. He, he contradicts himself two times. Yeah, and so he stated that he, he's an advocate hugely for states' rights. And he's indicated that that's how marijuana will remain, that it will be up to the states, which is fine, because all the states are eventually going to go for it. Did you see the latest thing in the Wall Street Journal? Maybe not. What? Oh, my goodness. Colorado, 18,000 new jobs. Oh. 18, because of marijuana, 18,000. Now imagine every state could add at least 18,000 new jobs. Due to the job force. Get this, Alan. The total economic boom to Colorado, not just the selling of the marijuana, but all that's required in the entire industry and what it's done there, $2.4 billion. Wow. And that's just their state. I wanted to talk about jobs. That was next on my list. But speaking of Colorado, I recall during the campaign, Trump said, well, when he was asked about it, he said something in, in the effect well, just look at what's going on in Colorado. It's a mess. The whole thing is a mess. He's talking about the marijuana laws. That's not true. No, if Trump wants to promise jobs, which he yeah. can deliver, the marijuana is the roadway for him. I mean, look at it this way, Alan. How many people work in the tobacco industry? Who knows? I don't How know. How many people work in the alcohol industry? Oh, yeah. It's got to be million. Yeah. All total? All the booze out there, you'll have the same amount of people working in the marijuana industry, maybe more, because you got the medical end of it, you got the euphoric end of it, you got a plant here that was here before we were. And let me state this for all the religious people out there who truly the evangelicals I'm speaking to that are probably not listening to your show, Alan, but we'll try anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, God made it. That's right. That's right. You know, this is an organic plant that if you believe in God, God made it. He must have gave it to us for another reason other than to eradicate it. That's right. And, you know, when you you look at the medicinal uses of marijuana and the things that, like the story you told in the beginning, uh, the seizures under control, glycoma, uh, heart disease, have so many things. I remember talking to Dr. Dean Adele uh, several times on this subject, and he talked about research that confuses scientists because back in the early 70s and late 60s, they assumed, just like cigarettes, the hippies and all the people smoking pot would grow up, and as they became adults, they would come down with cancer. But for some reason, unlike cigarettes, that didn't happen. Well, now that you mention cancer, read Steve Cubby's intro in my book. Yeah. Steve Cubby was dying of adrenal, non-operable adrenal cancer. All the doctors gave him a five-year death sentence. He said, you, you will be dead in five years. There's nothing we can do. That was 35 years ago. He went on heavy marijuana cannabis. 
it, it shrunk the tumor, benigned it. He's been a lot. Then they arrested him. He's the guy that spearheaded getting medical marijuana legal in California in 96. Mm. He got targeted by the DEA for doing that, our government. They raided his house like they did Tommy Chong. SWAT team, helicopters, the whole thing, because he was now, quote, legally growing the plant. He had 14 of them in his home to keep himself alive. And they threw him in jail. Yeah. And he lost 22 pounds, and the cancer came back. He then got out. They, they fortunately got him out. Back on marijuana, the cancer subsided again. He's living in Canada now where he can get all of it without being harassed. Wow. Now, when you read that intro to my book, you will be so angry at the United States government, you would probably elect Donald Trump. It's Jesse Ventura. <laughs> well, you know, if, 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 if he came out, if he came out, and made some positive comments towards legalization, he might have gotten much closer to winning me over, despite his faults. Oh, yeah. Now, he has the opportunity here for job creation and to do the right thing on this. And I'm not going to criticize him. I know Donald. I've known him for 25 years now. And I'm not going to say anything until about a year from now. Right. Give him a little time. I will give him a year, and we'll see how he governs. And my point is, if he wants to create jobs, which he's maintained is the most important thing to build America great again, the best thing he could do would be to legalize marijuana because that's jobs waiting to happen. You are absolutely right. And it could be the, the next new craft beer thing, you know? Oh, it would be. I, I mean, right now, the, the, the Mexican cartels, 30 they're down to 30%. Smuggling marijuana, they've switched to uh, meth and heroin. And let me add this, here's another thing that's been destroyed. They always tell you marijuana's the gateway drug to heroin, right? Mm -hmm. Well, every state that's legalized it has saw a drop in heroin use. Excellent. Because, and let me state this personally from Minnesota, we lost our prince. Had he been smoking pot, we'd still have him. Yeah, but that's he right. Was he was on pharmaceutical opiates that killed him. Yeah, he didn't smoke pot. I was, I was, that was fascinating to me. No, yeah. he was on opiates. Yeah, some of the most that fentanyl or whatever. It's supposed to be fifty times more potent than heroin. Yeah, Jesus, unbelievable. And 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 doctors can give you that, and they can't give you pot. I know. I know. And, you know, even back in the early days when they, they made marijuana available in some situations and you had to get marijuana that was grown by the government, the pills that people got were so potent, it would knock you out. You would be on your ass all day. You couldn't get up and be functional. You couldn't do anything. Well, but, yet, but a hit or two of marijuana not only got people moving and feeling better, they were able to actually make a living. Well, and here's another argument that they throw out there, another false thing. Oh, the marijuana today is way more potent than the stuff you had in the 60s. That's true, but that's a good thing. Yes, it is. And I'll tell you why, because it's like alcohol. You can have a 20% liqueur and drink it all night long, or you can go get 151 rum and be kicked into tomorrow in an hour. Yeah. Well, the same holds too for strains of marijuana, the potency of it, and the more powerful, if you're a smoker of it, the more powerful it is, it means you smoke less. That's right, you smoke less. And so the, isn't that healthier? If you only have to inhale it once, yeah. and you're good for the next three hours or whatever, however long it goes, I don't know. That's true. Then then that's healthier. Back in the 60s, sometimes you had to smoke a whole joint to do that. That's right. And that's, that's the logic that I always use with friends that say, oh, yeah, it's much more powerful. Well, that's good. That's like excellent. you said, you just take a hit or two and you're done for the for hours. And then, you know, if you need some more later, you get some more. It could last you for months and months. If you, you know, that's the thing. It just, this misconception and propaganda that people believe. All from Hearst. Well, oh, yeah. And what could we do to fight this? Well, what you're doing right now, what I'm doing, writing books, mm -hmm. re-educating the public that they've been lied to about this phenomenal plant. By the way, the book is Jesse Ventura's Marijuana Manifesto. It is out. Uh, Jan Hobbs is the co-author. Really, you, really good. You want to hear something else interesting, yeah, Alan? Yeah, sure. You can actually live off marijuana. 
eating it? Yep. It has nutrients that can s- sustain your life. Wow. The whole plant. Yeah. I you know, the, the plant itself. Yeah. Is so, uh, I don't get it. I feel like, Tom, remember Tom Hanks and Big? Yeah. With the, when the guy's doing the, the, the skyscraper that turns into a robot? Yeah. And Tom Hanks goes, I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> That's right. I have uh, the same feeling about mar- marijuana in our country. I don't get it. That's the thing I don't get. We're at such a point with all the education that is available to people about it, all the things that were written about it, the books, the the university studies, and we're still putting people in jail? This just blows my mind. Well, we cover that in the book, too. That's because you have corporate prisons now that are required to be full. Yeah. See, when they turn a prison, everybody yells, oh, privatize everything. Well, the bad thing about privatizing is then it's not to provide services, it's to provide profit. Mm -hmm. So prisons must be full in which for the corporations to show a profit to their shareholders. So we go into all that in the book, and and then the slave labor. These corporations then sublet the prisoners out who are working for 10 cents an hour producing products out on the market. Unbelievable. You and, know, it's an entire system. And, that's, and, and, and let me add this, Alan. Sure. This is the problem today with the relationship between the police and the people is because of the war on drugs. Oh, it's yeah. It's caused the militarization of the police forces and this mindset of shoot first, ask questions later. Actually, that's exactly right. And also, it's made other drugs available for people who maybe couldn't get marijuana maybe it does not around so they the, the, the dealers would say we got this we got uh, angel dust all these other things these dangerous drugs were there to fill the demand because marijuana couldn't be when they were putting paraquat on marijuana and it was scarce all these other drugs the use went up oh yeah Absolutely. And like I said, all the states that have legalized have seen a drop in heroin use. Right, right, right. And right now, we have an opiate epidemic in this country. Can I have you for another 10 minutes? Sure. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let, let's talk about the big drug companies. Because in your book, you talk about how the uh, big pharma has a patent on an important part of marijuana or, or, or an artificial, what is it? Uh, well, what they want to do is what they always do. They want to create marijuana in a laboratory. Right. Well, it's far better like food. You're better off eating the organic food generally that comes from the ground the, mm-hmm. the way it's supposed to be rather than creating something in a laboratory. And they want to be able to create to be able to mass sell it, laboratory produced marijuana with the THC or whatever is needed in it, rather than doing it the organic way of simply growing it and allowing the plant to be what it is. Jesse, what are some of the other ailments that marijuana is useful for? We've mentioned a few already. Well, like I said, seizures, it's curing certain forms of cancer. Uh, It's good for glaucoma. Head trauma in the NFL, the concussion issues, as well as post-traumatic stress. The uh, uh, military guys that are coming home from the war say marijuana is the only thing that gets them through the day. Is now, that- my view is these guys have suffered enough. They did what was asked of them, and I'm speaking now as a fellow veteran. How dare our government deny these guys anything that would make their day go better? I know. It, there was a case here locally where a uh, a vet needed his marijuana and he was buying it, you know, in the underground and he was fine with that for a while. But then he said, you know what? I need this for my condition. Yep. I'm sick of being a criminal. Yep. But, so he went out openly and went to the police and said, well, you know, do something about arrest me because I need this. And the doctors, he had a list of doctors that recommended it. And they wouldn't change the law at all for him or anybody else in in North Carolina, where I'm doing the show from. It's pretty much run by Republicans. Although recently, the uh, 
the governor of North Carolina, it looks like he's going to lose. I think by the, they're recounting the votes, I think it's about five, 6,000, the Democrat won. But other than that, it's all Republican. And they turned down every opportunity to even get medicinal marijuana well, discussed. Obviously, then they're on the take because always follow the political money. Mm-hmm. So clearly they're being paid off by Big Pharma. They're getting paid off by the alcohol industry. They're getting paid off by tobacco. They're getting paid off by all of these entities that don't want marijuana made legal, which could hurt their business. That's right. So it's just the typical what goes on. Pay off the politician and get the law in your favor. That's right. The drug companies. We have out there. That's right. Now, is Trump going to continue with that system? I hope he changes it. I hope he does, too. I don't know. Like you said, let's give him a year. We'll find out. We'll kind of take a look at this. And I'm not going to hold back, and either are you, nope. if he doesn't even get close to this. So the media has, you know, I've always looked at marijuana coverage on the news as, you know, maybe tongue-in-cheek here and there, and the Saturday Night Live and pop culture would celebrate it in its own way. But when it came to news coverage, I found it, they just didn't go far enough. They would not report the truth about the medical research. Do, do you know who did the best I've seen lately? Who's that? Brian Gumble on ESPN or on HBO. No, well, I'm not surprised. Tell me he, about it. Oh, you'd love this, Alan. I, I roared over it. I said, he went out and covered tailgating at Mile High Stadium now. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and here's the deal. There's a dispensary right across the parking lot. Oh, man. So you can go to Bronco games now, go right across the parking lot, buy the marijuana you desire, and, the, and, they, and he interviewed the tailgaters. Mm-hmm. They, 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 he said, is there a difference? They said, it's a it's hundred times better today. And Gumble said, Why? And he said, they said, because we used to have to get here at 8.30 in the morning and start drinking. <laughs> they said, by the time the game came, every, people would be throwing up, there'd be fights, there'd be bad behavior all over the place. Yeah, that's right. They, they said, now we arrive for the game at 11 o'clock, we toke up, we eat our food, and we go inside and thoroughly enjoy a football right. game, and nobody's fighting, nobody's throwing up, and they showed film of people fighting in the stands before fighting in the parking lot and all this stuff. Absolutely. And the best part was the end of the piece. Well, then they went over to the uh, d- dispensary and uh, across the lot, and they said, how's business? They said, it's great, but we usually only get the visitors because the Coloradoans already have theirs. <laughs> so, and right while they're there, some kid all decked out in Baltimore Raven gear come in. <laughs> oh, man. You know. <laughs> Wait, but let me get to the end. Yeah, yeah. In the end, they didn't on camera go to Peyton Manning, but they talked to him off camera, and here's what Peyton said. And I love Peyton. He's the perfect, quintessential, perfect athletic spokesman who never does nothing wrong. Right? Right. Absolutely. Here was Peyton's quote In light of recent changes in the law, he goes, my pizza franchises are doing phenomenal. <laughs> That's great. And I thought, what a perfect answer. He didn't even say marijuana. No. And, and you know, Peyton owns, I think, 19 Papa John's throughout Colorado. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and so he said, in light of recent changes in the law, my pizza stores are doing fantastic. Oh, man. But, you know, it, it's, <laughs> now what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, do you still live in Mexico full time or just? No, half? no, I only live there half the year. Half I'm getting the... ready to get out. I actually work. Guess I have a new job. I work for Russian television. Well, yeah, I was going to say, because you're uh, off the grid show. You're not doing any more on Aura TV. No, we had, there was kind of a fallout upstairs. But uh, I, uh, but Russian TV, RT America, had picked up my off the grid show and immediately when it fell apart with aura they immediately jumped in and said we'll do it we want you with us and i just signed the contract with them oh that's great so in fact i covered the elections for them yeah i saw that i saw a promo for it with uh who was the host uh from formerly of msnbc ed schultz, ed schultz that's right yeah and, we, and you know this is a thing i love they call 
They call this Russian TV a propaganda mechanism for the Kremlin, right? Yeah, I've heard that. Well, isn't it interesting because it's all paid for by the Russian government? Well, so is PBS. Yeah. That's paid for by our government. And here's my argument. Ed Schultz, Jesse Ventura, and Larry King, how can you be any more American than us? Absolutely. Absolutely. And nobody there has told me what to talk about. Nobody has put handcuffs on me. I met Putin last December. He said he will never interfere with my content or anything I say. Wow, that's great to know. So it starts pretty soon. Uh, Here's what gets me, Alan. mm -hmm. I'm a Vietnam veteran who has lived through the entire Cold War, and the Russians are giving me my free speech? Yeah, that is very strange. It's it's kind of, you know, every time I watch a show on RT, it's hard for me to believe that it's Russian television, but it is. And they have, you know, the people are talking about the same things that we're talking about in this country, and it doesn't seem slanted to me. But It, it isn't a bit. Well, do you watch the Hawks? Yeah. That's my son. Oh, that, uh, on, on RT, the Hawks? Yes. Oh, that's right. He's been working for him now for three years or the more. And I, I, that's one of the reasons I did it. I now work for the same company my son yes. works for, and I wanted to be able to put on my resume, see, I want to become friends with Russia. By the way. And anything I can do to help that friendship, I'm going to do. Yeah, that's good to know. I want to keep, when we keep in touch, because I always everyone's worried about Putin now because of his relationship, possible relationship with uh, Trump. I think it's great. You know, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see. I wanted to know, do you still smoke pot? I mean, you have in, Only I know, in Colorado. That's right, where it's legal. That's how I got to answer that. No, I understand. <laughs> I understand. And same sort of thing here. But, I, but soon in California. <laughs> yeah, soon in California. And soon. Washington and Oregon and Washington, D.C. Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Oh, that's, that's very encouraging. So, yeah. There's more and more states that if I do decide to indulge, I'll be able to. The only problem is if you live in an other, another state, you travel to that state, and you want to bring some home, they're waiting to bust you right over the state line. I don't buy that. You don't think so? I drive across this country to Mexico every year. Those free. I live in South Minneapolis growing up. On the, we have a street called Lake Street that dissects the city from the Mississippi River to Lake Calhoun perfectly straight. It used to be the drag strip for us on American Graffiti. Remember the movie? Yeah. That's Lake Street. I see. Well, our freeways today are so crowded, they look like Lake Street without the lights. Yeah. How the hell are they going to be pulling anybody over? If you drive the speed, it is so packed out there. Very. As long as you drive the speed limit. How, why would you get pulled over? Well, that's analytically the way I think, but I, at the same time, the the uh, the maybe I'm not saying I'm paranoid, but if I was good to go to another state, I'm not saying I would, and drive back with any quantity of marijuana, I'd be nervous. Well, certainly uh, you'd have to be, but uh, there's no, I drive across the country, there's no, the only thing, I'd be more nervous if I was a Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> because you have to go through immigration stops yeah. in Arizona, yeah, which I find horrendous. I, I remember getting ready to hit one. We had to wait an hour, and my wife turns to me and she goes, "I guess we better get our passports out again." I said, "Don't you dare!" I said, "We're in the United States of America. We showed our passport at the border. They're violating the Constitution if they ask me to prove my citizenship." And when we pulled up there, I rolled my window down. The guy came over. I looked right at him. And you're going to have to bleep this. But I said to him, I ain't showing you shit. You know what he did? He waved me through. Oh, man. And I did it on purpose. because uh. I, And I looked at him and said, you're violating the Constitution. You have no right yeah. to, to ask anybody to produce their citizenship papers traveling. Do you think he recognized you? Maybe. Yeah. They always do at the border because I give them Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Where Whenever are your I come papers? up to the border. Well, the first question they ask you at the border, I do it every year and it's ridiculous. You <sighs> know what the first question you get automatically? Are you carrying any? Uh, no. What? How long have you been in Mexico? Uh, and my version is, what the hell business is that of yours? Yeah. 
I'm a human. I, I'm coming back to my country. If I'm here for two days or eight months, it's none of your business. Second question, they ask to see your license. That's when I give them Cheech and Chong. I look at the guy and go, well, ain't it on the back? <laughs> I actually had a guy start laughing and go, it's too early in the morning for Cheech and John. <laughs> he knew what it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I started laughing. I said, uh, well, you asked me these silly questions, you're going to get silly answers. Oh, man. You well, know? We, I mean, what business is of theirs? How long I've been in Mexico. I'm coming back. I'm showing them a passport. I'm coming back to my own country. Don't have to, what, I got to tell them what I did in Mexico? Um, God bless you, Jesse. I love your guts. No, I'm a rebel as hell at the border. Yeah. And then here, here, I'll give you another one I do. Yeah. I have a level three protection dog, right? Oh. Belgian Malinois. Oh. He's so well trained. Whenever I pull up to the border, I give him the order to bark. He'll get all of their dogs going crazy. <laughs> And then when I pull up, I look and go, God, look at my dog. He's perfectly behaved. I said, your dogs are horrible. Oh. And they don't know that my dog started it. So your dog started barking, then you say quiet? I ordered him to. Uh, he only barks when ordered. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And so I gave him the command to bark on purpose with the windows down because I knew all their do their drug-sniffing dogs and all that would go ballistic. Uh, and well, they did. What's your dog's name? I don't even tell you that. All right, that's fine. I love dogs. <laughs> I, 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 I was wondering so if he all, were a dog. All the orders are very secret when you buy one of those dogs. It's a it's a two-day process turning him over to you, and you get him at age year and a half. Uh, but it's uh, the best investment I've ever made, and I'll tell you why. You can miss with a bullet. This dog won't. Wow. And I bet you that when, when you have the dog home, he's a great family dog. Completely. Yeah. I always describe to people... If there was a soldier in the room, would you be frightened? They yeah. go, no. I said, because soldiers only attack when ordered to. Yeah. I and I said, it. the dog is the same way. My dog is the nicest dog you would ever meet until I want him to not be. Give him the order. <laughs> well, listen, folks, the book is called Jesse Ventura's Marijuana Manifesto. I can't wait to get my hands on the copy. It is out now. <laughs> And, uh, Jesse... Oh, uh, oh one last cheat and Sure, talk. sure, man. When they ask me how long I've been in Mexico, I give them a week, a day. Oh, I'm sorry, a weekday. <laughs> I do. Oh, I give it to real? him right out. That was the other line that I had. And the guy looked at me and said, it's too early in the morning for Cheech and Chong. Oh, man. <laughs> and, you know, I bet you the first Cheech and Chong thing you've ever heard was the first one I ever heard. It was around this time of the year. It was Santa and his old lady. You remember that one where he, the Cheech and Chong were talking about the, the story of Santa Claus? No. Go on YouTube. Watch it. Just put Santa and his old lady. Cheech and Chong, it was their first record. Very, oh, very right. first. No, record. I've never even heard it. I got to go hear that. Yeah, it's great. You'll get goosebumps at the end, and, <laughs> and it's it's just great. Cheech, uh, uh, Santa and his old lady, Cheech and Chong. Do that. I, I will. Thank you, Alan. Jesse Ventura, Marijuana's Manifesto. Can't wait to talk to you again. Good luck on the new show. Jesse, have a great holiday weekend. You too, day. Alan, and keep up the great work, and thanks for giving me a venue out here. I, I, I have only the Russians and you. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, you got it, man. Anytime, Jesse. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.